Since Bennon came home from school sick last night, and Lorraine doesn't feel well. Uh, so he's home again every other week. I don't have COVID. We have PCR tests immediately after school. So. Is it going around schools? Oh, there's so much. Yeah, we so have much yeah. going around school. Well, uh, so much going around school. It's hard to think. But you know, because my guy's a junior in high school, and last year it was just every day it was we've been exposed. But and mask, my mask that I offered in school last March. Okay. He got home. He got sick. Went to school a week. Got sick. Went to school a week. Got sick like three times in a row. Every other week he was home, and then it stopped. You know, it was seven now. So yeah. I mean, he's really good about wearing a mask, but he rubs his eyes and, you know, hand washing. And, yeah, I mean, that's so, he brings it all home and gives it to Lorraine and I. Oh, yeah. It's a great. I do. I, we, Lorraine and I both felt, Linda, when we moved here from Pennsylvania, we got here and we're like, gosh, there's all new diseases here. We're just getting sick all the time. You know, when we first got here, the first couple of years, you know, our, our older kids just kept bringing home things from school and we just kept getting sick. Well, that's interesting. It was really interesting. Home, we never got sick in Happy Valley, is that right? Really, no, well, no, no, there's no disease. Or yeah, there was no disease yeah. in Happy Valley. Yeah, no, I got sick a lot there. So were you, you were at Canada or were you at the medical school? No, we were at the university. At the university, university. yes. State College. Yeah. Not College Station. Not College Not Station. Not Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize you've been since so you did your PhD or your yeah. postdoc PhD. Yeah. And, and two years of a research faculty. Uh, yeah. Yeah, John Olson on our evaluation team was at Penn State. Do you know okay. that? John Olson? You know that name? Morning. I don't know if, well, yeah, let's not do it. I, one of the nice things of CSSS seminars is they introduce the city here. Okay. And then everybody goes around the room and just says their name and affiliation. Okay. And do that in here. But I don't know if it's going to work. It's hard. Too, uh, and I don't want to exclude people. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe I won't do you that. Have to like Wow. You can be a guinea pig only to some degree. You don't have to be a guinea pig in every way. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So, which of course is exactly. I'd love to have you work on some data. And we have a method for and they like to talk to people. I just remember, and I would know Yoni Chang. From I saw her on her project. Um, she, yeah, but she, but she I, I was like, how can you do this in one year? <laughs> so it, was, it felt a bit accelerated. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Like the, the analytics yeah, I'm around. I'm around. I'm off the week of Thanksgiving, but I'm around between now and then. So just to get to you every day. So. Okay. So far, so you good. Stay here. <laughs> yeah. Parents, we get it. Good. And then he came home for the Mariners uh, oh, game, <laughs> which was yeah, a little foolish, but it was important to him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see him at Thanksgiving. We're gonna stay. I'm gonna hey, just give it. Looks like we have some people on the Zoom. Um, we are going to get started in just a couple of minutes.
Good morning. Uh, let's get started. I'm Brian Flaherty, an associate professor in quantitative psych here at UW and the Burge Methods Board Director. And thanks for coming to our this year's Birch Speaker Series seminar. And uh, I have a couple of logistics things and then we'll uh, get started. So this is item one, welcome and logistics. And, uh, and Linda will have the floor. And then we have about a half an hour at the end for question, answer, and conversation. And we are recording this. So it will be available for you to review if you wish. And we do have a fair number of people on Zoom. I don't know the right number right now, the exact number right now. And uh, we will ask you to raise your virtual hand or we can uh, try to unmute and ask questions. Um, I'll be paying attention to the chat box in the back of the room on Zoom. And I'm happy to relay your questions or you can, we can work it out and do it yourself. We should have the working audio here. And there will be an evaluation following this workshop and we do like to hear what people think. So um, let me introduce Linda quickly so you can listen to Linda and not me. So I'm very happy to introduce Linda Collins. Uh, she was my graduate advisor, which is kind of fun. And uh, she's a professor in global public health in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at NYU. She earned her PhD in quantitative psychology from USC. So Linda has had a stellar career, all kinds of things, all kinds of work, and it's ongoing. I'm not going to even bother summarizing it. There's a lot of things, but if you, she worked on latent class and latent transition models and then moved over to this domain of intervention optimization, which is what she's going to talk about this morning. So, Linda, why don't you take over? Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and I just want to reiterate, if anyone wants to ask a question at any point, uh, go ahead. And those of you who are on Zoom, um, uh, I hope I'll, I hope one of us will notice um, if, if you raise a, a little hand. I think we will. Um, but if we're not, uh, feel free to put something in the chat, or if you'd rather just go ahead and uh, ask a question in the chat, that, that's fine. Um, okay, well, that's me in case you didn't know. Um, okay, so we're talking uh, today about achieving uh, intervention ease by means of the multi-phase optimization strategy. And I will uh, explain what I mean by intervention ease in, in a few minutes. I want to start um, by just making this statement, uh, which is, I want to suggest that to achieve uh, greater public health impact, it's important to consider two things. One, consider affordability, scalability, and efficiency, along with effectiveness. And effectiveness, of course, is really important, but there are trade-offs sometimes between effectiveness and affordability, scalability, and efficiency, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And I also want to suggest it's a good idea to consider optimizing to achieve intervention ease. And I'll explain what I mean by that in, in a moment. I know a lot of people here are interested in implementation science. And if you take a broad view of, of implementation science, it's about getting effective interventions out there where they can actually be used and have an impact on public health. And so that's kind of my perspective on, on implementation science to try to think about developing implementable interventions from, from the very beginning. So I'm going to start uh, by talking about, oh gosh, so people can't really see the- We're working on it. I'm going to just adjust the screen. Sure, okay. I'm just going to go, oh, okay. Sorry. No, that's no problem. Uh, I forgot to share it. Oh, oh, people were seeing it, okay.
Thank you, Angela. That's great. Yeah. That solved the problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to um, um, start by. Well, now we've lost the. Now we've lost the Zoom people. Um, I'll keep. I'll just keep. They're all there. They're all there. Well, we, should just, yeah, yeah, we can't. Yeah, but I won't be able to see them if they raise their. Oh, there's a virtual else to do, right? okay yeah to, yeah yeah we'll do that okay all right so i'm going to start by talking about why i believe it's important uh, to consider uh, affordability scalability and efficiency from the very beginning i'll talk about uh, what i mean by intervention ease and how you can achieve it uh, by means of the multi-phase optimization strategy which is a an, uh, an alternative methodological framework for, for intervention development and evaluation I'll run through an example of, of intervention optimization, and we're going to have a little detour there because some of you uh, might might want a little um, refresher about factorial design. So I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk about uh, one possible vision for the field of intervention science if, if people started using uh, intervention optimization more. And then I'll just uh, end with a few closing remarks to tell you where you can go if you're interested in more information about these ideas. Okay, so why it's important to consider affordability, scalability, and efficiency from the outset. First, let me um, uh, describe for you the classical treatment package approach. I don't really need to describe this because I think you're all familiar with the classical treatment package approach because it's just what's done and it's what's been done from the very beginning of intervention science. The idea is there's a number of components that go into an intervention. I have five here, but of course, it could be any, it's often, often more than that. And they may be pilot tested. Uh, and then at, once they're conceptualized and pilot tested, they are immediately uh, assembled into an intervention package. And that package is then evaluated in uh, an RCT. An RCT, of course, stands for randomized controlled trial. And uh, that is a, a typical uh, experimental design where um, there's usually a treatment group and a control. Sometimes there's more than one treatment group. Uh, and the idea is a direct comparison of the performance of the intervention to the performance of some kind of a suitable control or comparison group. So that's what I mean when I talk about RCT. It's important to draw that distinction because I'm going to be talking about other kinds of experimental designs that are also randomized and also controlled, but we don't call them RCTs. That term uh, RCT is reserved for that particular type of experimental design that I, I, just, I just described by convention. Okay, so there's obviously nothing wrong with the RCT. It's a great experimental design, um, but it's important to recognize that it assesses the performance of the package, the treatment as a package. It does not give us any information about the performance of the individual components that go into the package. And of course, there are some things you can kind of do after the fact to try to get a sense of that, but there's really nothing in the RCT itself that addresses that question of what is the performance of these individual components? Which ones are working? Which ones aren't? Okay, so keep that in mind. We don't know if, if, if we use the classical treatment package approach, we don't know anything about the performance of individual components. So what are the consequences of that? We can't consider affordability, scalability, scalability and efficiency without really knowing anything about the performance of these components. For example, let's consider affordability first. And I'm gonna define that as the extent to which the intervention is effective without exceeding budgetary constraints. So there may be some budgetary constraints or, or the constraint may simply be that you want to be sure it's cost effective. Right now, there's little incentive for academic intervention scientists in the US anyway, uh, to think about affordability. And in fact, um, if you talk to an intervention scientist, as I have done many times and ask, um, well, who would you expect to pay for this intervention if it goes to scale? Very often, it's clear that that's the first time they've ever thought about that question. So there's a real disconnect there. Of course, if you get to a point where, where you would like to 
implement an intervention. But let's say you developed an intervention using the classical treatment package approach. It's been shown to be effective. Now you'd like to implement it somewhere, but it turns out it's too expensive. What do you do? Well, the obvious solution would be to remove one or more components to make the, make the intervention cheaper, but you don't know which ones to remove. And those kinds of alterations are really risky if you use the classical treated package approach because you could remove one or more critical components. So as a consequence, many interventions are just never implemented. I mean, lots and lots of interventions are developed and just never implemented, which is really sad. Um, or they're implemented with undermined effectiveness because ad hoc modifications are made at, at the local settings where they're implemented. Sometimes there is not even any record of these, Some, sometimes there is, um, but all, all the implementer can do is look at the intervention and say, well, I think I'll remove this and this, but that they really, there really is no basis for making that, that kind of a decision. Next is scalability, which I'm going to define as the extent to which the intervention can be implemented widely with fidelity. And by fidelity, I mean exactly as it was evaluated, exactly as it was evaluated in the RCT. So the prevailing logic today is first establish effectiveness and only then worry about scalability. So first establish effectiveness, make sure the intervention um, has a detectable effect in an RCT, and then worry about scalability. But what, again, this is very similar to what we said before. What if the intervention turns out not to be scalable? It's too complicated. It's too burdensome for staff or participants. What then? Well, so you have the same problem. You want to make alterations to reduce the scope and burden of the intervention, but you don't know which components can safely be removed, and the consequences are the same. Many interventions just are never implemented for this reason, or they're implemented, but their effectiveness has been undermined. Now, let's think about efficiency. I'm going to define that as the extent to which the intervention avoids wasting time, money, and other valuable resources. Suppose you are an intervention scientist, probably everyone in this room is, and you're developing an intervention based on the classical treatment package approach. And of course, what you want is that significant RCT, right? That's gonna make your career, you wanna want obtain a significant effect in an RCT. And we've already said that there really is little incentive for you to worry at all about cost. So you're not gonna worry about the cost of the intervention. So what's the logical thing to do? The logical thing to do is to include a lot of components in the intervention. You don't know for sure which components are going to be effective. Of course, you don't know. So you're going to just include a bunch of them. That's the smart thing to do. So as a consequence, many of our evidence-based interventions include an unknown number of components that are not having an effect. And all they're doing is taking up time, money, and other resources. And it's even possible that some of those components are having negative effects, which is some now. So just to sum up, many interventions are too expensive or otherwise impractical, they never get implemented. Um, many have been subject to ad hoc modifications that have undermined their effectiveness. And I, I would venture to say, this is a speculation, but most of our interventions have one or more useless components that could just as easily be taken out. So is it any wonder that Lisa Ankin and other Lisa Ankin and NIA and others have said, so many efficacious behavioral interventions do not make their way down the pipeline through them. There's a big disconnect there for the reasons that I just reviewed. So this, that's why I believe it's so important to consider affordability, scalability, scalability and efficiency from the outset. Now let's talk about intervention ease and how you can achieve it. What is uh, intervention ease? Ease is achieved by balancing effectiveness on the one hand against affordability, scalability, and efficiency. 
Now, I think you can see that there is very often a trade off there. If you don't worry about, let's say, affordability or scalability, then you can probably achieve a more effective intervention. But we also know that public health effectiveness is a function of both effectiveness and reach. And you could develop the most effective intervention that has ever been known. And if it never reaches anybody, then its public health impact is exactly zero. So the question is, how do we balance effectiveness on the one hand versus affordability, scalability, and efficiency on the other hand? Now, one answer to that question is it's different in every case. It's different, in, in, it's different for every intervention. So that's why my collaborators and I have developed this approach, optimization by the multi-phase optimization strategy, or most. And so most is an alternative to the classical treatment package approach that enables intervention optimization to achieve intervention needs to balance effectiveness versus affordability, scalability, and efficiency in a way that's strategic for you, depending on what your objectives are. I want to define optimization, and then I want to um, make two points about optimization. One thing about optimization, I hear a lot of people use the word optimization. Um, it's almost become um, a little bit trendy to, to use the word optimization and optimize, but um, I believe that in scientific writing, it's important to have a clear definition of what you mean by it. Optimize. Opti optimization is a broad concept. We use one definition, which I'm about to share with you. I don't think it's. I don't think that our definition, the one, the one we use in most, is always the definition that should be used. But I do think that it should always be defined. So our definition is: optimization is the process of identifying a strategic balance of effectiveness against affordability, scalability, and efficiency. So that's, that's our definition of optimization. That's a little bit different, if, if any of you um, have read my book, a little bit different from the uh, definition we use in the book, but it's, it's uh, just a little bit different, not, not essentially different. So now the two points I wanna make. One is, and this is really important, optimization is not about finding the absolute best. And this is where I differ from some people because a lot of times people will use uh, the term optimize. Oh, I want to optimize this. But what they really mean is I want to find the best. But in engineering and other fields that, that, that use optimization, that's not what optimize means. It's always about this. You're always trading off. You're always looking for a balance of what's good versus what the costs are or some, some other kind of downside. So it's not about finding the best. Optimization is about finding the best you can actually use. It's about finding the best you can actually use in practice. That, that is, I think, a really critical point. The absolute best in our field in intervention science would be the most effective intervention. But that most effective intervention might be so expensive or complex it would never be important. So we're looking for the best we can actually implement. So optimize is the most effective subject to realistic constraints on things like willingness to pay. Who's going to pay for this and how much are they willing to pay? Available staff time. Maybe it's an intervention to be, to be delivered in the emergency department. And those people don't have an hour to sit and talk with someone most of the time. They would have less time than that. A tolerable level of complexity for staff and participants and so on. Anything else you can think of. The second point I want to make, and I'm going to come back to this later, is that there may not be one single optimal intervention. What is optimal may vary across settings and time, and that's okay. This is a schematic uh, of the multi-phase optimization strategy to give you an overview. I'm gonna walk you through it. 
The one thing that I should probably say now about most, you probably um, figured this out already, but it's a really different way of thinking. It's a really different way of thinking about all this. So some of these ideas are maybe going to be a little bit counterintuitive to you. So I'm looking forward to um, talking about, about that. I'm feeling like there's like a short in this or something. I wonder if you yeah. pulled it away from the jacket. Is it rubbing on? Okay. I was I wondering if that was one thing that might. Sometimes if it, if it has that, some kind of feedback. I can try turning the volume down and see if that's all. Like I yeah, I can turn on the ceiling mic. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. That works very well. Okay. Well, make sure that folks can hear. Yeah, folks on Zoom, if you can't, can you hear, can you put you raise your hand? Can you hear okay? yeah, that? David, who are you there? Um, so, audio folks, is good. Can, can you still hear audio? audio is good. Wonderful. Oh, okay. okay, that's great. This is better. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So this is a schematic of the multi-phase optimization strategy. And notice it's multi-phase. There are three phases. And the phases are preparation, optimization, and evaluation. In the preparation phase, you lay the groundwork for evaluation. You're already familiar with most of what happens in, in, this, in this phase. You would uh, devise or possibly revise um, a conceptual model. The conceptual model in most is very, very similar to the logic model that underlies many behavioral interventions, but it's a bit different because in the most conceptual model, you have to specify which component of the intervention targets which mediator or mediators. So there's kind of an additional level of specificity there. You would identify a set of, notice it says candidate components. And they're candidate components because they're candidates for inclusion in the intervention. It's, it's not a foregone conclusion that they're all gonna get into the intervention. And that's a big difference. With the classical treatment package approach, you identify a set of components and they all go into the intervention. That's a sure thing. But here, the, the intervention components kind of have to earn their way in, into the, uh, the uh, intervention by showing that they perform well. Any pilot work is conducted in the preparation phase, including pilot testing the optimization trial. And you would identify an optimization objective. And that's one thing that's a little different. The optimization objective is your definition, your operational definition of what you mean by intervention ease. So for example, your, optim your optimization objective might be the best expected outcome for that I can get for an implementation cost of $500 a person or less, or the most cost-effective uh, set of components, or the set of components uh, that gives me the best expected outcome and takes no more than, than 90 minutes to, to implement. So those are just some examples kind of off the top of my head. There's, you know, there's, there's an infinite number of different possible optimization objectives and uh, the intervention scientist just selects one that is suitable for your own work. The next phase is optimization. In the optimization phase, you build the optimized intervention. One thing, of course, you have to do is conduct an optimization trial. And here I've listed a number of experimental designs that can be used for an optimization trial. None of them are the RCT. The RCT is typically not used in optimization. It is used in evaluation, but it's not used in optimization. So the factorial experiment, which I'm gonna talk about uh, in a second, the fractional factorial experiment, the SMART trial, the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial, I think a number, number of you have heard of that, the micro randomized trial, those are all actually variations on the factorial experiment. Uh, the system identification experiment, that comes out of a different tradition, that comes out of control engineering. So once you've conducted one or maybe more than one optimization trial, you now have data on the performance 
of these the individual components and whether they interact with each other, depending on the design that you use. And then you can use that information to identify the set of components that will give you the intervention that best meets your optimization objective. So that's the basic idea. So the purpose, again, the purpose of the optimization trial is to assess the performance of individual components. And then you can use that information to identify what is the, the optimized intervention. And then the final phase is evaluation. And in the evaluation phase, you would conduct an RCT to, uh, to evaluate the performance of the treatment package that you, the optimized treatment package. So that's kind of an overview of the multi-phase optimization strategy. Now notice that we have this diamond here. Is the optimized intervention expected to be sufficiently effective? There's no guarantee that the optimized intervention is going to be effective. What if none of the components have a detectable effect? What if maybe only one of the components has a detectable effect? So at that point, you are not going to want to continue on to the evaluation phase. Instead, you're going to if you look at that purple arrow, you're going to go backwards to the preparation phase. There's two fundamental principles of most. One of them is the resource management principle. The resource management principle says that it's the scientist's uh, responsibility to make the best use of research resources. And that means things like you carefully select the most efficient experimental design you can. You don't waste resources there. And you don't go ahead to the evaluation phase unless the optimized intervention is sufficiently promising. Because you don't want to waste money on an RCT if the intervention is not promising. The other fundamental principle is the continual optimization principle. This says that optimization is a, an ongoing process, that the multi-phase optimization strategy gives the intervention scientists the opportunity to keep improving the intervention over time. When you think about how consumer products are developed, cars, computers, washing machines, you know, really anything you can think of, look back over 30 years, those have all gotten incrementally better over time. Now you could argue about, you know, some of the successive uh, releases of, of, you know, Microsoft Word or something like that, but overall you can see a pattern of improvement over time. And think back over 30 years of intervention science, have we seen that kind of steady improvement over time? And I would argue no, and I think that's one reason why we, we need a different approach. Okay, are there, oh yes, did you Jane. want to take a question? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so my first thought was, I'm surprised to see a randomized control trial there. I was thinking, okay, implement it. This to me, optimization is efficacy. Okay, yeah. it works in this control setting. Now let's implement it. Does, does what you figure out, do we already know now? Can we just roll it out? But no, you said you really do need the RCT in that stage. Well, um, yes, I know I said that. I, I don't actually think, that it's interesting. I've been getting that question a lot the past couple of years. Um, and, and I actually think that there are times if, if the um, results are really clear at this point, if the results are really clear, that, that you probably could go directly to a rollout. Um, hybrid designs. Or a hybrid, yeah. I think that would be a great, a great case for a hybrid, for a hybrid, really great time to try one of those hybrid designs. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, other other questions? There's a number there. Those are all. I'm paying attention. Great. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. An example of intervention optimization, and we're going to take a very brief detour for a, uh, a crash course on uh, the factorial design. This uh, is an example in smoking cessation. 
This study uh, was conducted at the University of Wisconsin Center for uh, Tobacco Research and Intervention, CTREE. It's run by Mike Fury uh, and Tim Baker. And this was supported by a P50 a, a while ago. Uh, the team included uh, Megan Piper, Robin Mermelstein, and me, as well as uh, others. And the idea here was to try to arrive at an efficient smoking cessation intervention made up of all active components. So we were trying to weed out any inactive components. I know I'm using the word phase uh, more than one way here, but um, long before I met Mike and Tim, they developed a, what they call a phase-based model of, of cessation. And that was kind of part of the ideas underlying um, uh, the components that we looked at. We looked at 11 components in two optimization trials. So this was a big study uh, because we had P50 funding. Uh, and the, these two trials were conducted simultaneously. So I'm going to show you the candidate components that we examined uh, in the Wisconsin study. The first experiment uh, looked at components that, that uh, pertain to the preparation and cessation phases. So the preparation phase is a few weeks up. Let me back up and say everybody set a quit date. So the quit date kind of anchors this. The preparation phase is a couple of weeks up to the quit date. Then the cessation phase is, I think, the quit date and three weeks after. And then maintenance is three weeks up to like, you know, se several weeks later, depending on maintenance is a little more open-ended. Okay. So preparation use of a nicotine patch could be on or off. Preparation oral and RT could be on or off. Now, if Mike Fury were here, he would want me to say the following. And I think it's, <laughs> I think it's a, good, a good point to make. Everyone in this study got nicotine replacement therapy at the quick date. Everybody got that. What we, were, what we were experimenting on here is whether taking NRT before the quit date was helpful. So this is preparation phase NRT. I just wanna make that clear. Preparation phase counseling, on or off. Uh, cessation in-person counseling. This wasn't on or off, it was two levels, intensive versus minimal. Cessation phone counseling, intensive versus minimal. And then the duration of medication, that's the duration of NRT, 16 weeks versus eight weeks. So that's what we looked at in that experiment. Yet the second experiment, extended medication, 26 weeks versus eight weeks. So by the way, this was one set of participants. This was a different set of participants. Maintenance counseling delivered by a telephone on versus off. Medication adherence counseling, they got two 10 minute sessions versus none automated medication adherence calls. And then you're probably familiar with MEMS cap devices. It's an electronic pill cap that tells you when the records, when the pill bottle is open. There's something similar to that that you can use for NRT. And that, that's the, that was the helping hand device here. Okay. So we examined these components in two separate optimization trials. The maintenance phase experiment was a two to the fifth um, factorial experiment. That's a two by two by two by two by two factorial experiment. And you can see why we go to that exponential <laughs> notation. And then the other one was a two to the six minus one. That just means that was a fractional factorial experiment. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Okay. So let's say you're new to most and you're considering an optimization trial and what you want is to examine six different intervention components. What are your alternatives? What would you? What are, what are some alternatives you might consider? Well, if you've been trained primarily in the RCT, probably the first thing you would think is, "Oh, I'm going to do six RCTs. I'll do a, a, I'll do an individual experiment on each of those components." So, if you did that, you would need about three thousand experimental subjects and you would have to, you have 12 experimental conditions. Six of those would be an experimental condition. Six would be a, a control. Then you might think, okay, maybe I don't need all of those experimental conditions. Maybe I can have one shared control. The control group would be, would be the same anyway. So I'll do what's called a comparative treatment experiment. You've seen these, I think. They go by a number of different names. They all have the same statistical properties. And the idea here is that you've got one shared control group, and then you've got for example, one experimental condition where the first component is set to on or high and all the others are off. Then you have a second one 
where the second experimental condition is set to on or high and all the others are set to off or, or low. So that is a more compact version of this approach. If you did that, now that's more efficient. You've got seven experimental conditions and about 1,800 subjects. So, so that's, you know, you have saved the number, you've reduced the number of subjects. That you, you also could conduct a factorial experiment, a two to the sixth factorial experiment. That would require only 512 subjects. And I know right now I can see cartoon bubbles over some of your heads. Some of you do not believe. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you in a moment. I don't think Lydia, I don't think you really believe this, but I'm going to show you in a moment. However, this is, you know, tough, uh, 64 experimental conditions. But look at this, look at the scientific yield. You can look at all of the interactions. And I would love to talk some more about interactions that people are interested in, in that during the, the uh, discussion period. What we actually did in the Wisconsin study was not this, we did this. We conducted a fractional factorial experiment where uh, we still needed 512 subjects, but it cut the number of experimental conditions in half. I don't really have time to talk about fractional factorial experiments here because that's kind of a big uh, topic. But let me just say there are important trade-offs. They're not, not for every situation, but and they are always powered exactly the same. In fact, if you use power analysis software to power a factorial experiment, it doesn't even ask you whether you're conducting a complete or a fractional factorial experiment. It doesn't need to know. They're powered exactly the same. But you will always uh, reduce the number of experimental conditions considerably by using a fractional factorial experiment. But there are trade-offs. You can't, you can no longer estimate all the effects. So we can we can talk about that some more if you want. But that's anyway, that's what we did here. So now we're going to take this brief detour because I want to convince you that this is really true. That 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 factorial experiments really under some circumstances can be a very, very efficient approach to examining the performance of individual um, intervention components. So this is a two by two uh, factorial. I think you've probably all had that somewhere in your training. Suppose there were two factors, both, off, both could be off or on. So uh, there'll be one experimental condition where they're both off, one where they're both on, and one where A is on and B is off, and one where A is off and B is on. So that's all possible combinations. Very soon, like on the next slide, I'm going to switch to this way of depicting the, the experimental conditions because once you get past a two by two, a, a table like that is really hard to read. So I'm going to switch to th this. This has exactly the same information as here. Factorial experiments can have more than two factors. And I'm going to show you on the next slide a factorial experiment with more than two factors. And of course, in the Wisconsin study, we had five factors in one and six factors in another. So you already know this. They also can have more than two levels per factor, but I don't usually recommend including more than two levels per factor. And if you want, I can explain why during the, during the discussion. So on the next slide, we have a two to the fourth factorial design. So these are the experimental conditions in the two to the fourth factorial experiment. There's there's two to the fourth or 16 experimental conditions. And there's, if, if you arrange the conditions neatly uh, and, and each, um, each factor has two levels, you see this kind of characteristic pattern where um, you see that factor A one through eight uh, in conditions one through eight is off and in conditions nine through 16 it's on and so on. So there's this kind of characteristic pattern uh, of factorial experiment. So. What are we trying to estimate with a factorial experiment? We're actually, if you conduct a factorial experiment, you're actually trying to do something pretty different as compared to an RCT. You don't have the same objectives here. Probably the most important for decision-making in an optimization trial is the main effect of each factor. And that is defined as the definition, that is defined as the effect of factor A averaged across all levels of all the other factors. So the, the main effect of factor A is the effect of factor A averaged across all levels of all the other factors. That's the definition we're using here. 
And that, by the way, is the definition Fisher gave us. So this is a well-established uh, definition in statistics. You also are interested in interactions. You're also interested in interactions. Now, decision-making in this framework kind of starts with the main effects, but you always have to reconsider the main effects in the light of any important interactions that you find. So what's an interaction? I think the best way to think about an interaction is consider two factors, factor A and factor B. If the effect of factor A is the same, no matter which level of factor B you look at, there's no interaction. If the effect of factor A varies depending on which level of factor B you're looking at, then there's an interaction. Okay, so why are factorial experiments so efficient? Main effect of factor A, it's gonna be the mean of conditions one through eight versus the mean of conditions nine through 16. It's the mean of the conditions where A is off versus the mean of the conditions where A is on. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's look at the main effect of B, factor B. The main effect of factor B is the mean of conditions five through eight and 13 through 16 versus the mean of conditions one through four and nine through 12. Notice that all of the experimental participants were involved in the estimate of the main effect of A, and they're all involved in the estimate of the main effect of B. And similarly, they're all involved in the estimate of the main effect of C and the estimate of the main effect of B. It's exactly the same. This is why factorial experiments are so efficient. They kind of recycle experimental subjects in a way. So every subject is involved, if, if, it, if it's a two to the K experiment, when things get, get a little bit different when you have more than two levels per factor, but for right now, uh, let's just stick with two levels per factor. Every uh, subject is involved in every effect estimate. And that's tremendous, that's a tremendously powerful way to conduct science. This is why the factorial experiment was, was first invented. And it cracks me up that um, people using most writing grant proposals will, will often say, and I, I encourage people to do this, oh, we're using this innovative experimental design. And I always think, well, yeah, it was innovative. It, it, was, it was developed uh, in the, the uh, late 1800s. So it's been around for more than 100 years. So I guess it's innovative in one sense, but it's old, it's very old. It was, of course, as everyone knows, developed in agriculture. So here's some interesting facts about factorial experiments. And you already know this. When used to address suitable research questions, balanced experiment, factorial experimental designs often require many fewer experimental subjects than alternatives. I think sometimes people who uh, have been trained primarily in the RCT, look at um, experimental design like, like the one I showed you and say, oh my gosh, that's a 16 arm RCT. But in a factorial experiment, the objective is not direct comparison of the means of the individual experimental conditions. So that means that the logical underpinnings of the power analysis are completely different. And if you still don't believe me, Lydia, you, you could try reading uh, any of these uh, articles. This one in particular um, is meant to be an introduction to the factorial experiment for a, a brief introduction to the factorial experiment for people who've been trained primarily in the RCT. So the second interesting fact is that factorial experiments can have very small per condition ends and still be well powered. That is completely not true of the RCT. But if you look at what we were doing here, what we did in the Wisconsin study, 16 per condition. Now an RCT with 16 participants per condition, no, no way. I mean, that would be a pilot study. You know, there's no way that would be a fully powered experiment. But here, I assure you, this is a fully powered experiment. And the reason is that 
uh, in an RCT, power is driven by the per condition sample size. But in a factorial experiment, power is driven by the sample size per level of each factor, per level of each factor. So sometimes you can have a pretty small per condition sample size and still be adequately and it's often possible to add one or more factors to a factorial experiment and maintain the same level of power without any increase in the number of participants. That's why very often someone will, will come to me and say, well, I'm, I'm thinking of conducting an optimization trial. I want to conduct a two to the third optimization trial. And a lot of times I'll say, well, can you, can you manage any more experimental conditions? Because if you can, you can look at one or two more components without needing to increase the number of participants. You'll have to manage more experimental conditions, but you won't need to find any more participants. Um, I just want to point out again that one reason why I always emphasize factorial experiments as opposed to these other uh, designs when I talk is that all of these except uh, the, the system identification experiment are in the factorial family. So kind of understanding you know, this, these, these kind of basic concepts about the factorial experiment um, also kind of gets you to the SMART and the micro-randomized trial. So let's go back. That was a little detour. Let's go back to the Wisconsin study. So which components hit? Preparation, uh, use of oral NRT that was in lozenge form. Uh, cessation in-person counseling at the intensive level, extended NRT, it looked like people did benefit from 26 weeks, maintenance counseling via telephone, and then automated medication adherence calls. That one really surprised me. I thought that was just, just going to be annoying, but people like that. So, The results of those two optimization trials were published in the journal Addiction in 2016. And um, then uh, we did an RCT in a primary care setting against a control group called Modern, uh, Modern Standard of Care. And uh, the RCT did find uh, a statistically and clinically significant effect for the, for the intervention. Okay, so that's an example of an application of most, um, kind of from beginning to end. I'd like to share with you one possible vision for the future of intervention science if more people started using most. And, and I will tell you um, very frankly that I'm on a, a, a campaign to get more people to use intervention optimization. So suppose interventions were routinely optimized to achieve ease. I think one outcome would be that interventions would be more efficient because we would eliminate a lot of inactive components. They'd be less wasteful and less burdensome, again, because there wouldn't be as many inactive components in, in the interventions. And I have to say, if I could have just one thing, it would be this. If, if we could just eliminate inactive components from interventions. Um, my experience in the last 15 years or so with optimization trials has suggested to me that it's likely that, our, that the effects of our interventions are being driven by many fewer components than we think, which is disturbing in one sense, but also I think offers a lot of hope because if we could identify what those components are and add more components that had uh, similar effectiveness, we could really start moving forward. we would develop a solid base of knowledge, a coherent base of knowledge that could be built upon. <clears throat> right now, I feel like, and this is just me editorializing, but I don't know whether others feel the same. It seems like every new intervention kind of reinvents the wheel. And it would be nice if we had a base of knowledge. Okay, here's, here are some components. We know those work. We know they should be included. We don't need to test those again. Let, or at least we don't need to devote a lot of resources to testing those again. Instead, we're going to develop some new ones and add those and, and test, test those. So we would uh, develop, I think, more knowledge about what works and for whom and under what circumstances. If you, if you conduct an optimization trial, you can do some really interesting secondary analyses. First of all, you can do really interesting 
mediation analysis that will enable you to look at what moderate, what, what mediates the main effect of, of each individual component. And also if there are interactions, interactions can be mediated too. You also can do interesting moderation analysis. If you're interested in looking at whether characteristics of the individual or the environment might moderate uh, the effects of a particular component, you can examine that. And that can um, help you develop the foundation for an adaptive intervention in the future. So you really get a lot of information from an optimization trial, potentially. Um, intervention adaptation, um, now this is one aspect of intervention adaptation. Uh, intervention adaptation, kind of a, I think a broad concept. And I feel like, I'll tell you frankly, that I feel like I don't necessarily understand um, all the nuances of it. But one, um, one aspect of intervention adaptation is trying to achieve the best outcome you can in each setting. So let's suppose you've conducted an optimization trial. I'm gonna show you how you could adapt an, interve an intervention to two different settings using the results of the same optimization trial. Now you have to be able to assume that the results of the optimization trial generalize across the settings, but you'd have to assume that if you had evaluated the intervention using an RCT anyway. So let's assume that the results generalize, but, but, the constraints are different in the two settings. So the basic behavioral processes are the same, but the, con the constraints are different. So you conducted an optimization trial. You've looked at five components. I won't name them. I'll just call them one, two, three, four, five. And setting A can afford $300 a person. So you optimize the intervention. You identify the set of components that will give you the best expected outcome for $300 a person. And let's say for setting A, that's components one, two, and four. Now, by contrast, setting B can only afford $200 a person. So now you take the same results of that same optimization trial, same results, you're not running the study again, and you can optimize for a constraint of $200 a person. And maybe now this is components one, three, and five. And I want to point out to you that $200 is less than $300, obviously. But this set of components is not a subset of this set of components. So that just goes to show, and it's really easy to show that that can happen. <clears throat> so this just goes to show that the idea of <clears throat> developing intervention for the most resource rich possibility and then removing components to detune it for a less, for, for more resource poor environment is, is not the best way to achieve what you want. I also think that we would progress through the NIH stages of intervention development more quickly in the long run. I think we get um, <clears throat> from stage that's basic research stage to uh, efficacy research faster. And of course, I think we get from effectiveness to implementation and dissemination faster. And of course, I just want to make this point that most can be used to optimize um, implementation and dissemination. If you're pretty satisfied with the intervention itself and all you're interested in, in working on is, is the implementation strategy, you can think of implementation as an intervention, kind of like I sometimes call that a wraparound intervention. And, and the intervention that's being delivered as a sealed intervention. It's sealed because you're not, you're not doing anything to it. It's just, you know, it's already been optimized or whatever. I mean, you're not gonna do anything to it, but you are interested in something having to do with, with uh, fidelity or engagement or something like that. I also love the idea of interventions becoming better and better over time. I, I, even, I even like the idea of interventions possibly being released with version numbers the way software is, with the idea that they would just, we would always keep working on them and that they would just incrementally get better and better over time. So this is from the NIA website again. And they said, intervention development is not complete 
until an intervention reaches its maximum level of potency and is implementable with a maximum number of individuals in the population for which it was developed. I agree with that, except for one thing. I would say that intervention development is never complete. The people who developed the BMW didn't, didn't say, you know, 15 years ago, well, we're done. You know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna develop, uh, we're not gonna improve the BMW anymore. We're gonna stay with the, you know, safety features we have now. We're not gonna improve fuel mileage. And we think it's pretty good, so we're not gonna do anything more with it. That's not the approach in consumer products. And I don't think it has to be the approach in intervention development either. Okay, just a few uh, closing remarks. Um, just re some recent work in future direction, in case you're interested. Um, I'm one of the um, MPIs of uh, a center at a NIDA funded center at the University of Michigan that's working on new optimization trial designs for optimization of adaptive interventions. So those are interventions where part of the intervention is uh, a set of tailoring variables and decision rules for changing the intervention dosage or content, um, usually over time. So, for example, um, you would uh, maybe it's a, a <clears throat> smoking cessation intervention. Uh, you give people, maybe everybody would get an initial treatment, and then you follow people, and people who are still smoking after a week might get uh, some additional, some additional uh, treatment. Um, I am in the process of setting up a new center at NYU called the Center for Advancement and Dissemination of Intervention Optimization, or CADIO. And we are working on a number of things, but one that's really interesting is methods for decision making involving multiple outcomes uh, and looking for value efficiency. So you can uh, imagine that, of course, everyone now, if you are conducting an optimization trial or an RCT, you have to register optimization trials in clinicaltrials.gov, just, just you have to register um, RCTs. And you are forced to you to register one outcome. But most of the time, people want to make the decision uh, about the optimized intervention based on more than one outcome. That, of course, creates a very complex decision-making problem because, of course, um, some components will work great on one outcome and they won't do anything at all on another outcome. I mean, in intervention uh, work is never simple in that way. Uh, and by value efficiency, we mean if you have data on cost, you can then kind of weigh cost against uh, the outcomes. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting work being done on that now. And, and there's we have a, a paper we just resubmitted uh, to the journal Health Psychology. So watch for that if you're, if you're interested. And then, of course, uh, we're always working on applications in, a, in many, many, many areas. Don't buy these books. Uh, you can download PDF versions from the Springer portal at the UW library, I'm sure. Um, the one on the left is a comprehensive introduction to intervention optimization. And the one on the right is an edited book that covers a number of advanced topics. In individual conversations with some of you, you've mentioned cluster randomization and there is a chapter about that in there. There also is a Coursera course that's an introduction uh, to most. And we're actually about to change that. Um, so it might, it'll have a different title uh, by the middle of next year, but the content will be the same. So this is a completely asynchronous course, but um, uh, we also do synchronous trainings that are, are based on this. So the idea is uh, if you take one of our synchronous virtual trainings, you have to do the asynchronous course but then there are um, group exercises and opportunities for discussion and so forth in, in, the, in the synchronous course. If you're interested in that, get on the CADIO website because we have, a, we have one coming up in January and uh, you can apply to uh, attend that, but applications close very soon. They close November 1st. And that's the, the URL for the CADIO website. There's a lot more resources here. Uh, there's a bunch of FAQs. There's a tutorial on using REDCap to manage an optimization trial uh, and announcements about up upcoming trainings and activities. We're still in the process of getting this website set up, but, but uh, that's what's there now. So that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening to me talk about my favorite subject. And uh, I would love to uh, 
hear what you have to say. I have a question. Yeah, people are thinking. Um, so one thing you skipped over pretty much in the beginning, the very first slide, very first step, you have five components, you put them into an intervention, but often we don't know what those five components are. We just have a black box intervention. And we think it's one thing. We think it's CBT, we think it's electronic messaging. Um, I don't know, some other kind of therapy that mm -hmm. we use kind of counseling or safer sex counseling intervention. Um, we don't often know what those components are. And I think that the devil's in the details, right? If yeah. we really had clear, distinct, non-overlapping components for everything we did, it would be easy to do this, but it's hard to do that. Mm -hmm. It is hard. But but do you do you see the field progressing unless that happens? Um, well, I'd say, how can we do that? I think it's good to think about those components early on is the way to approach yeah. it, right? To just think about it earlier and think about how we might be able to, I mean, I've heard of dismantling studies to kind of help you get to that. Like yeah. maybe you did this, I call the black box, put everything in kitchen sink interventions. I've yeah. done them, everything. Let's try to get this to work. Right. You know, this is a pilot for an R34. We want to get the R01 funding. We have to show some significant effect or some, you know, some uptake that, of it. That, that, that thing about, that's a whole other topic oh, of conversation. Gosh. NIH forcing people to do that. It's yeah. a waste. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. But, um, and then just trying to dismantle it. Okay, we did everything, but did we really need to do this step? Because this was the most expensive. And a lot of people didn't even stay engaged in it. Yes, you right. Take it out. Yeah. So, but so I like your idea of starting ahead of time and not thinking about having to go back and take things out, but think about what maybe we shouldn't even have had in, in the first place. Yes. Um, and actually, a, a lot of people over the years have, have um, talked to me about um, having already having an intervention that has, has some demonstrated efficacy and now wanting to um, you know, possibly conduct an optimization trial and having this issue of, but we don't really know what, what the components are. And one caution um, I would offer is, I always say to people, don't reverse engineer the, the uh, conceptual model. It's much better to go back, like, almost forget about the intervention, just temporarily, and go to the literature and develop a model of the process that you that you intend to intervene on, because what you might find then is that there's a mediator that you would like to hit that is re really there is not a component in in the intervention, or you might have several components that are actually all hitting one thing, and you've left something out. And it, it's very it's it's really really tempting to reverse engineer the intervention. It's also even if you haven't done that, I find it's really tempting to just start listing components that you want to put into the intervention. It is really hard to develop a good conceptual model. There's a chapter in the edited book about developing a conceptual model that shares some of the pain of a research group that I was involved in where we just went through, I don't know how many drafts of the conceptual model. We just, we just, I wouldn't even want to tell you how many drafts of the, of the conceptual model. It just went on and on. It, it, it is, it's re, it is really hard. It's a, it's a big conceptual lift. But I also feel that even if it's a little bit raw, even if the conceptual model is a little bit raw, um, I, I just feel strongly that it's, it's the way forward. Yeah, Lydia. Yeah. Sort of the related question about intervention components. Um, and I am convinced by your presentation of the factorial design okay, um, with the example of smoking cessation being, you know, this it, the components are individually administered. Yes. But when I, some of the interventions that we work with are implemented sort of at a practice level and yeah. so requires, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around whether a factorial design is possible. I mean, it would basically be, I mean, it would have to be cluster, you're sort of thinking about well, I guess that's the question. Is it possible to to you to apply this to something that's if the component is implemented at a practice level or an organizational level? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it, it's I don't mean to uh, to dodge that question, but um, it's really hard to talk about experimental design in the abstract. You really have to just you know sit sit across the table from each other and and uh, you know figure out what you want to learn by conducting an experiment and then you can figure out how to do it. Having said that though, um, it, is, it is possible to do cluster randomization uh, in, in, uh, in a factorial experiment. It's, it's possible to use cluster randomization in, in a factorial optimization trial. Um, it, it, of course, multi-level 
um, trials, that is where you have randomization going on at more than one level are extremely complicated. But most of the time that isn't needed. Uh, in the Wisconsin study, we implemented that study in a dozen different healthcare settings. And so there was that element of clustering there now. I admit the Wisconsin study, it's a good teaching example because the uh, components are pretty independent, they're pretty independently delivered. Um, but one thing you can do is uh, with, with the Wisconsin study, we um, kind of replicated the experiment within, within each healthcare setting. That made sense there because we didn't, uh, for a variety of reasons, we didn't think that there was going to be a lot of contamination. If you're worried about contamination, of course, then you have to be randomly assigning a higher level, like you know, a whole practice. Um, the issues there are about the same as they are um, if you're conducting an RCT, except that, and this is an important except, that with a factorial experiment, you have more experimental conditions that you have to populate. Right, because it's gonna, you're not gonna need, you're not gonna need a lot more individual participants. But if they're clustered into a practice, then you, you know you don't want an empty cell. So we we, we actually there's there's an article about that um, that we published a number of years ago in the journal Psychological Methods that talks about that situation and advocated. Uh, that people consider using fractional factorial designs because that reduces the number of um, experimental conditions that you have to populate. Brian, were you going to say something related to this? No, I was just stopping this question. Please. Just worried he's going to have to do the methods. <laughs> <laughs> Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but I would be um, you know, really happy to talk with you about your individual situation. Yeah, what's the Zoom question? Charles Fleming asked, can you talk a little bit about the role of statistical significance testing and the decision-making about what components to retain or drop? It seems like type one error rate will be a problem when testing multiple components, even just in terms of main effects, the interaction effects where the uncertainty of estimates are much greater would seem to give rise to even more type one errors. Yeah. Which kind of touches on my open my question and something that you could talk more about in our Yeah. Yeah. So so I'll just repeat the, the question in case not, not, not everybody heard it. Uh, the question, uh, at least to start with, is about the use of hypothesis testing when you're making decisions uh, based on the results of an optimization trial. And is aren't there an awful lot of hypothesis tests? And don't you worry about the type one, type one error rate? So that, that's a complicated question. Uh, so let me, um, and, and, it, and it's an important question. It's a really great question. So let me uh, talk about that for a moment. One thing I wanna say is that there are different ways to code data when you're conducting uh, factorial analysis of variance. And although, uh, although um, different ways of coding data will usually lead to the same uh, omnibus F test, the individual hypothesis tests uh, will be will often be different because different ways of coding actually amount to different definitions of main effects and interactions. And you guys might be more accustomed to what's called often called dummy coding, which is zero one coding. Everything I talked about today assumes effect coding, which when you have a two to the K experiment is minus one one coding. And the reason why that's important uh, in relation to this question is that uh, when you use effect coding, if you have a balanced experiment, so you have equal ends or even approximately equal ends, and the structure is the characteristic structure of the factorial experiment like I showed you, the effect estimates are all uncorrelated. Now contrast that with dummy coding, where the effect estimates, no matter what, are very highly correlated. So that doesn't solve the type one error issue, but it does go a little way, to, a little ways toward um, mitigating that. And also, um, this this is, isn't the type one error issue, but uh, if you use dummy coding, people worry about interactions contaminating the main effects. And there's a sense that you start with the highest order interaction and kind of work your way down. And um, 
Yes, I, I think that probably is a great way to proceed if you use dummy coding. But with effect coding, it's the opposite. You start with the main effects and then work your way, kind of work your way up, re reconsidering the lower order effects as you kind of step through the higher order effects. And there's there's a uh, there's a really great book on the use of um, the analysis of variance and factorial experiments in engineering by Wu and Hamada. That's just a really, really clearly written, excellent book that talks about uh, that kind of approach to, to decision making. Not for optimization trials, of course, because they're doing they're working with like ball bearings and stuff like that. But a lot of the basic idea is the same. But getting back to hypothesis testing, I'd like to uh, share with you um, the difference between um, what I call the conclusion priority and the decision priority approach to using scientific information. We've all been trained with the conclusion priority approach, which is you start, you set out to do a study because you want to draw a conclusion about whether an effect exists or not, right? And so the first thing you do is a power analysis. So you start with a rough idea of what you think the effect size is and what your sample size would need to be to give you reasonable power. If you don't have the resources, to get that sample size, you don't do the study. If you do the study and you, you um, do not reject the null hypothesis, you conclude, well, we don't know. We, we don't know whether, whether the effect is there or not. We couldn't find it, but we don't know whether the effect is there or not. When you're taking a, a conclusion priority perspective, you're gonna, you're gonna show your results, you're gonna share your results at science court. And by that, I mean, it's gonna go to peer review. And you have to follow the conventions of peer review, which say that you use a type one error rate of 0.05 or less, and you're satisfied with power in the 0.7 to 0.8 range, which means that you're satisfied with the type two error rate in the 0.2 to 0.3 range. So somewhere along the line, we all got together and decided that it was okay for us, in fact, we prefer to have a type two error rate six times the type one error rate. I wasn't there that day. So that, that happened at some, some point along the way. Okay, now contrast that with the decision priority perspective, which is what you take when you are optimizing an intervention. You have to make a decision. You don't get to say, we don't know. You have to make a decision about which whether whether a particular component is going to be in or out, or what level of, of the intervent of the component is going to go into the intervention. You have to make that decision, and you have to make it based on the resources you have or can reasonably get. So, hypothesis testing using a particular type one error rate is less important than using the data you have obtained in a rational way. You can probably guess that we're headed toward a Bayesian approach here. It's a much more, and, the, and there's a reason why Bayesian statistics is so closely aligned with the, the, the decision sciences. I, I now realize, you know, 10 years ago, I did not realize this, but um, I've been working uh, with Dave Van Ness, a, a health economist who's an expert in Bayesian statistics for the last three or four years. And he's just taught me so much. He's taught me like this much of, you know, all of what I, I need to know. But um, I can see now that uh, a Bayesian approach, which just basically says, okay, you've got this information. You have to make a decision. You need to find a rational way to make this decision. And it's not necessarily going to be based on um, uh, taking uh, a, a strict perspective on, oh, yes, we have to use this particular type one error rate. So those, that's kind of you know, two different perspectives on, on using information. In most, when you go to the evaluation phase, you're back to the conclusion priority perspective. But when you're in the optimization phase, you're, you're working from the decision, the decision priority perspective. So uh, people sometimes say, well, don't, don't you recommend using um, some kind of a, a correction for the type one error rate? I would say not in the optimization. I don't, because that will just, uh, you know, really, re that will really kill your, your power to do that. So I don't even, I mean, 
I personally don't even really rec don't even really uh, recommend using um, classical hypothesis testing. I would go. I would recommend either a more Bayesian approach or just go by the estimated effects. Just so you can say I, I want. I want to. Um, a, a particular component has to show an effects, a main effect size over this amount. Um, and then in chapter, um, I, think it's, um, I think it's chapter six of my book, I, I go through an approach to decision making where you look, you start with the main effects and then you reconsider every main effect in the light of, of the interactions. And sometimes a particular uh, component might not show a main effect, but when you look at the interactions, that appears to boost the effect of another another component. So then you might want to include it. Similarly, uh, you, there might be two components that both have main effects, but one of them really reduces the effect of the other one, and you might want to then move one of them kind of to the discard pile. So there's I, I talk about that in chapter six of my book. However, um, chapter six of my book is going to be obsolete, I think, in a, in a couple of years because. Uh, with um, Dave Van Ness, who I talked about a moment ago, and Jillian Strayhorn, the three of us have been working on uh, an approach based on uh, based on Bayesian deci decision making that is just a lot easier than going through all that. So that would pretty much eliminate hypothesis testing for decision making. You still, if you wanted to, could view uh, uh, an optimization trial from the conclusion priority perspective. And that might be that um, you know, you, and, and uh, I could imagine that there would be um, a, a particular component that might not have a, a significant main effect, but you but you might actually want to include it in, in the intervention for you know one reason or another. So the, I mean, the, they're they're really different, um, really different perspectives. Yeah. The table of effective components in the smoking example were those. Determined by effect sizes, so you kind of step yes, that was more. It was more by effect sizes. Yeah. Yeah. I maybe I misunderstood you, but I think yesterday you made a statement that we might not always need to do the the the, the confirmatory randomized trial at the end. Yes. Um. And and you also said that you've had challenges getting people who are trained up in the randomized control trial sort of paradigm to accept sort of the optimization and factorial design. So I'm just curious, um, under what conditions might we decide to forego doing that evaluative confirmatory mm -hmm. trial? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's a great question. So the question is, under what circumstances might we decide we don't need we don't need the uh, confirmatory trial at the end. We don't need the evaluation phase. Dave and S and I are actually um, working on that uh, because we think that a Bayesian approach is needed uh, to, to make that decision. Um, I will say that based on the results of an optimization trial, I, there are the branch, I didn't, I didn't show it in uh, the, the simplified uh, figure there, but there's kind of three different places you could go. Based on the results of an optimization trial, you might go to an RCT. You might go back. You might think, oh, this just isn't working. We don't have enough uh, components. Or you might decide this is, the results are so strong that we should just go ahead and implement this intervention and not go ahead to, to and not bother with an RCT. That would be kind of a waste to do an RCT. But um, a more formal approach is needed for more formal framework is needed for making that decision. And we don't have that yet. But I do, I, I agree that you would not always need, um, you would not always need uh, the RCT. Also, there's another kind of experimental design that I, I didn't talk about. There's a hybrid, um, uh, what we call a hybrid evaluation optimization trial. So that's a factorial experiment where one of the factors is the RCT kind of, and then you actually can include other factors to look at other components. Now that only works, only works if the components are components you would want to add to uh, later to the, the intervention that you're evaluating. But it is one way to kind of save time. Would another case be where you have 
high confidence that the sort of proximal outcome that you've chosen uh, for, the, for the optimization phase is clearly on the path to the distal outcome that yeah. you typically would focus on in that confirmatory trial? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and one, one way one way to save time in the optimization trial is to use a, a proximal outcome rather than go all the way to the distal outcome. And of course, fields vary in how confident you can be in that. But yeah, if, if you're if you're pretty confident and the results are strong, then yeah. Yeah, you know, to, to be you know, to be really candid with you guys, um, nobody would want to look at most if I didn't have the RCT up there. You know, it, it's just really important to have it be a part of this. And I don't, I'm not on a campaign to get people not to use the RCT. I am on a campaign to get people not to use it for every single study because you know, we all learned as scientists that no one experimental design can answer every research question. And really what this is about is selecting experimental design based on what you want to learn. That's really, really what it's about. So I guess the question is, after you've conducted the optimization trial now, do I feel like I need to learn whether this is going to work? Maybe I already know that it's going to work. Yeah, let me ask you a question about the using the CMS single optimization trial for adaptation and just wondering yeah whether that is just a simple sort of translation of like we use the example of cost and so you yeah. look at what adds up but is there further testing after that it just seems like um it, it would be more complicated than just saying which components no uh, there's no well you might you might want to i guess the question would be you would have to do two different RCTs that if, if you were going to go ahead with RCTs. Two different settings. Yeah, because, the well, because, because they're right because up. they're different, they're different interventions now. The two, right. the two, okay. yeah, the two interventions are it just seems like a really powerful piece of this, right? To be able to apply this to different settings. But it seems like I don't know, the cases that I'm imagining it seem like you'd need you potentially be additional testing in within that setting. But you might. Not. I mean, it, 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 if you if you needed an RCT, then yeah, you you'd want to go to the next step for sure. Are there any more questions on on Zoom, Brian? No? Okay. So are we? Are we done or I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, no. Okay, well thanks everybody. Thank you. Well Linda, can I just ask you who the course is best for just thinking about our students and trainees and yeah. methodologists? Yeah. yeah, it would probably it, it's really aimed at um intervention scientists, but I think at advanced grad students. And in, in the, the training.